Well, it's evident to me some of you can't read. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Don't shoot me an email. That's why I, <laughs> no, no, those words weren't part of the original Lord's Prayer, so that's why we didn't include them this morning. But hey, you do them out of habit, so I get it. Um, Hey, my name's Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship Bible, and we're glad that you're here today. Uh, I said it last week, if you got out last week because it was gloomy, um, man, you're really, uh, like, you're really in it to win it. If you got out on a day like today, it was kind of gnarly this morning. I saw some church members who took pictures in their neighborhood that's standing water everywhere, and so anyway, thanks for making the time to to get here uh, today. If you are visiting, you are a special guest. We are glad that you're here, and we would just tell you this. Our mission as a church is we exist uh, to worship God, to share Jesus Christ, and build believers, and you're around some of the, uh, the nicest people in all of East Texas, so we do hope that you'll let us know that you're here today. Um, it's Super Bowl Sunday. It's true. <clears throat> And so, um, sincerely, by, by show of hands, just because I need to know uh, who's spiritual or not, who's cheering for the Chiefs today? Woo-hoo. By show of hands, okay. How many of you are 49ers fans cheering for the 49ers? Okay, security, can y'all <laughs> come forward? How many of you don't care? <laughs> yep, yep, that's right. I've got a lot of work to do to get you to care about the Super Bowl, so uh, you're just in it for the commercials, I understand. And then all the Swifties in the room, raise your hand, see, there's there, too. Man, if the Chiefs win the Super Bowl uh, today and they show Taylor Swift, it will break the internet this afternoon. It's just going to be uh, a crazy day. And so, anyway, um, go Chiefs. Uh, for those that don't know, Wendy and I spent the last five and a half years living just outside Kansas City, and we were there for their two previous Super Bowl victories, so it was kind of hard not to get swept up a little bit in, in what they call the chief's kingdom. Uh, and so anyway, it, it's kind of fun for us. Also, before I dive in, I want to uh, let you know, just keep you up to date on where we stand with our associate pastor search and, and process. Last Sunday uh, was the deadline for evaluation. So Clay Smith, who's our candidate, was here two weeks ago. Uh, and, and then we left a week in there for evaluations. We received all of those, and all of those evaluations have been distributed to um, both elders and deacons for review. And then we'll be meeting as a combined board this Thursday evening. Um, to to vote on that and to discuss that. And so we would just ask for your prayers of wisdom and discernment uh, this week, specifically Thursday night at 6.30, uh, because we want to make some wise decisions um, on behalf of you, uh, the church, and and want uh, the right person for that particular position. And so we just cover your prayers. And as soon as there's something to announce, maybe next Sunday, one way or the other, we'll let you know what's going on. But I want to keep you up to date on that. Okay, um, I want to begin today with a question. And so here's the question. Do you um, ever do anything to impress others? Now, I already know the answer to this question because uh, we all do this, right? I mean, we do things to, to try to uh, impress others. Guys, if you, uh, maybe you're a teenager, a little bit older, maybe you're a college student that's here today and uh, you, you're just beginning to date or think about uh, dating and, and, and so you find a, a young lady and you want to take her out on a, a coffee date or, you know, sonic happy hour or whatever it is, um, you could, don't, hey, don't uh, underestimate sonic happy hour. <laughs> I mean, all the men in the room are like, that is a great value. Um, <laughs> You know, women are like, that's cheap first date. Um, so anyway, if you're getting ready to, to take her out uh, or just meet her to get to know her a little bit better, uh, guys, you, you know, you might not have taken a shower for a couple of days, but you typically take a shower and you do your hair. Maybe you even go and get a haircut um, or, you know, you press your shirt uh, or something that day or decide to wear socks when you don't normally. I mean, you do things to impress others. Uh, if you are having company come over to the house, uh, maybe you pick up around the house. You know, you fluff the pillows. Maybe you vacuum and get up all the pet dander and hair and, you know, all that sort of thing. And you put out the fine china and the nice dishes and you prepare your, the finest meal that you know how to prepare uh, when you're preparing for uh, dinner guests. If you're going for a job interview... Right? You might get a haircut in advance. You've worked on your resume, and you're making it look really, really nice, and you've studied up on the company. And so when you go in and they begin to ask you questions, well, you're ready to impress them with the answers. It's like you've done 
the homework. I mean, we all do things to impress others. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with putting your best foot forward or trying to impress other people. However, when it comes to living out our faith, when it comes to, as we've been talking about in this series, when it comes to living a kingdom-centered life, when it comes to worshiping God, we have to be aware of our motives. We have to be aware of who it is that we're living for and worshiping and who we're trying to impress. And so today, as we continue our series on the Sermon on the Mount, we come to chapter 6. And so if you have your Bible, you can turn with me there. We'll be in Matthew chapter 6. And it's at this point in the sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus begins to discuss motives for worship. People perform acts of worship for many reasons, but those who um, want to pursue a kingdom-centered life, I think Jesus is trying to tell us, hey, you need to watch your motives. It's not just an issue of what you do to worship God. The reason why you do it has huge implications. That's what Jesus is about to tell us here. It's critically important, our motivation for worship. So Jesus begins here in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1 with what I would call a general principle. We'll read the verse first, and then I'll share the principle with you. But um, he, he kind of underlines a, a, a general principle for everything that he's about to say in the next 17 verses or so. And so here's the general principle found in Matthew 6, verse 1. It says this. Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So let's look at this verse. When Jesus says, beware or beware of practicing your righteousness before others, he's saying, in other words, you need to watch your motive. Like when you do good things, make sure you're doing good for God and, and not just to put on a show for the people around you. You see, in, in our day, just like Jesus' day, there are people who do good religious things um, just to attract attention, just to do good in front of others and to impress others because they're interested in looking good in front of others. I mean, let's be honest. The odds are this morning with the number of people that are in this room, somebody's here this morning, not because you really wanted to be here. Like somebody's here today because you're trying to keep up appearances with a friend Maybe your college friends, you wanted to sleep in late this morning because it was cloudy and rainy, and you're like, man, I can't sleep in late. What are my friends going to think about me if I miss my ride to church this morning? Maybe you're here because you're trying to keep in good graces with your spouse. Man, you just know that if you don't get up and come to church this morning, you're going to hear about it this afternoon. I, I mean, it's, maybe it's a boyfriend or girlfriend, somebody that you're trying to impress, some people donate to the poor, donate uh, to charity, walk little old ladies across the street, you know, uh, walk with someone and cover them up with an uh, umbrella, all because you want to impress somebody else. Now, it's true that some people are motivated to do these things because they ultimately want to honor God and they want to obey God, but it's also true sometimes that they do those things hoping that someone else will see what a great person they are. Like, this is what Jesus is talking about here. It's sort of like if your motive for coming to, to church or doing some good deed, or as he's about to tell us, uh, in helping the poor or praying or fasting, all things he's about to talk about, uh, it, or performing really any religious duty, if you're doing these things to impress the people around you, in essence, Jesus says, that doesn't mean anything to God. And it's a pretty strong word he's about to bring. And so the general principle that Jesus, I believe, is trying to teach in, in this next little chunk of scripture is this. If you perform religious acts of worship to impress others, you'll miss God's reward. You'll miss God's reward. If you're trying to do religious acts of worship for other people, you'll miss out on what God has for you. 
And so in the next 17 verses, he gives us three examples to illustrate what he's talking about. He talks about giving, prayer, and fasting. And the reason Jesus talks about these three things is because in his day, um, these were the three greatest things a person could do to demonstrate their devotion to God. Giving to the needy, more specifically, we'll see that in a minute, and praying and fasting. And so Jesus says, let's not talk about what you do to to show your devotion uh, to God. Let's talk about why you do it. It's not about what you're doing. Why do you do it? You got to check your motives. Let's talk about your priorities and your motives. And so let's look at how this general principle applies through the example of giving to the needy. Look at verse 2. Jesus says, then, thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Okay. Let's talk about this for a minute. To be clear, when Jesus uses the word giving here, he's not talking about tithing, okay? He's not talking about your general tithe that you would give or that the Jewish people would bring um, to the temple with them and, and, you know, put in a a basket. He's not talking about that kind of giving. Um, He's talking about what they referred to as alms giving. It was the giving of alms. And alms are or financial support, money, or resources that are given to the needy. It includes beggars that you might give a handout to, right? It often included back then the disabled or or those who uh, had some kind of illness or, or something that prevented them from working and making money and not able to earn a living. For us today, that would include um, maybe sometimes giving to our church's benevolence fund, uh, which we do on uh, fifth Sundays around here. We take a special offering for that, and those, those monies are earmarked and reserved for helping people uh, lots of times in our church, maybe sometimes outside of our church, but helping people who are encountering some kind of financial crisis. It would include that. Over the last three or four weeks, uh, and thank you, by the way, for doing this, but you've been bringing non-perishable food items for our Super Bowl of Caring Uh, and dropping those off in the lobby. And those food resources uh, through the guise of Longview Community Ministries are going out to help people uh, maybe who need some food, who are hungry, who otherwise maybe can't afford that. It might be um, supporting a child through Compassion International. It might include your giving to, to World Vision. There's all kinds of things. It's any kind of giving... Um, through Hardison's Marketplace. I mean, you name it, any kind of giving that, that, that would be helping someone else less fortunate and needy and or poor. That's the kind of giving that Jesus is talking about, giving to those in need. And so then he says here, and I just kind of laugh at this metaphor, but it's like, he says, sound no trumpet before you. Now, I did the research this week because I was hoping to find out the opposite, but I did some research, and there's no evidence that they actually sounded trumpets when they were giving. I was hoping to find out (laughs) that they did. I mean, I'm just trying to imagine the scene. (laughs) You know, you're like, "Ah, ah," and it's like, uh, Alex Alexander is giving $50 to Longview Community Ministries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. They didn't do that. That's not what's happening here. He's using this metaphor to describe people, though, who wanted to make sure that everyone else knew that they were giving to the needy. Basically, he's saying, hey, when you give to the poor, when you give a handout, uh, where you're trying to help someone else out, he's like, just don't make a big deal out of it. Don't try to draw attention to it. Don't show off your generosity. And and the reason it's so important to guard our motives is because the reason why we give, the reason why we do these things determines how it affects our lives. Jesus urges us to give in secret so that our motives will be completely pure. And and then notice the last half of verse 4. He says, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. In other words, those who give from pure motives will be rewarded by God. Now, 
before we think this is some sort of prosperity gospel, uh, Jesus doesn't promise a specific reward. He doesn't mention a specific time when that reward will come or when you're going to receive it, but he does say that it will be rewarded. And so it's important we just kind of take a moment and, and look at this. It's interesting because the word, the English word reward that's here, when you, you look at it in the Greek, it literally means to pay back a debt or to render what is due. To pay back a debt or render what is due. That's the way the Bible describes it here. So if you, ha- if, if you give to people in need with a pure motive, not for how it's going to look to someone else, but you do it for the right reasons, you do it with a pure motive because you want to honor God, you, you want to be obedient to him, then it says God will pay back a debt. It, God will render to you what is due. And so to be clear, God, God wants you to give to meet the needs of other people. Not because God needs your money. But I believe because giving to meet the needs of people around you is an act of worship. And that's why he takes this so seriously. He's like, if, if you've been blessed and you have, then he's like, then share that. Just don't draw attention to yourself when you do it. And so the question for you this morning is not just, are you giving to the, to the needy? The question is, why are you giving? What's your motive? Why do you do it? Then, after talking about giving to the needy, Jesus turns his ex- example here um, to prayer. More specifically, again, our motives for praying. Look, in verse 5, he says, and when you pray, so make an assumption here, this is part of our worship, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, I mean, I'm just imagining Jesus is looking at his disciples. He's like, but when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret, here's that line again, will reward you. And when you pray, verse 7, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Okay, remember, Jesus is preaching to a very specific audience in a very specific context in a very specific day and time. And in this day and time, uh, there were people whose prayer life was nothing more than a show. And these people made it a, a point that when it came time to pray, that they would be seen, that they would be in a public place where everybody was sure to see them praying and hear them praying. And as a result, that obviously drew a lot of attention. I mean, if you were just, you know, strolling down to downtown Longview or out at the mall and somebody was just out there in a public place and they were just, you know, hands raised or whatever or kneeling down, I mean, as everyone else is going around, I mean, you would think, oh, I mean, you, you might think good things about them, but it's evident that they're drawing some attention to themselves, right? I mean, they're out in public. And that's what it's like in Jesus' day. So Jesus says, don't try to be like them. He's like, that's not what prayer is all about. Like, these people are claiming to talk to God, but in reality, they're, they're just talking to the people that are around them. Their motive's not to worship God. Their motive was to impress people. And so God says, Jesus says this, they'll get just what they're looking for. In verse 5, he says, truly I say to you, they've received their reward. So here's a reward. Those who pray to impress people get the reward of impressed people. Those who pray to impress people get the reward of impressed people. You've impressed the people around you. Good job. And here's the rub for you and me, right? If we're not careful, even in our context of doing church and our small groups and our Bible studies and our prayer time, our pastoral prayer time, they, they pray for uh, we had a group of people that meet uh, at 8.30 on Sunday mornings and pray for me or whomever's preaching that week. If we're not careful, if we're not careful, prayer turns into this kind of performance, right? We try to say the right words. 
We try to say them the right way. That's why so many times when you're called upon to pray, you're like, yeah, I don't mind. I'm hoping I you start sweating. Please don't call on me to pray. Please don't call on me to pray. Do you know why you feel that way? Because you're concerned about what you're going to say. And that makes your audience the people around you and not God. And so Jesus is like, man, this isn't what this is all about. You're not trying to say all the right things in all the right ways. Pausing at just the right moments for effect. <laughs> if we're not careful, sometimes our prayers are a form of gossip. Please, God, help Emily resist the temptation from seeing that guy. We all know that she can do better, God. <laughs> My apologies to all the Emilys in the room. Sometimes prayers are a form of gossip. For some, talking to God requires a special language, and I'm not talking about like speaking in tongues. Like, it's just like a proper formal language where you use Shakespearean English with all the these, the thous, and the thou shalt nots, and that sort of stuff. Apparently, it's very important to get the form right, too. That's just one of the reasons that we have you know, written prayers and we make prayers that rhyme to use at specific times. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to see you know that. Or before we eat a meal, what do we say? God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our FUD. Yeah, see, I've never understood that one because it doesn't rhyme. Listen, I'm not saying uh, that there's anything wrong with written prayers or the King's English. What I'm saying is, is too often when we pray, we're worried about getting it right. And Jesus is saying, don't worry about getting it right. And the reason we're so concerned about getting it right is because, well, we're more concerned about the audience of the people that are around us than our audience of one. I mean, I think you know this. You can say the longest, most eloquent prayer for all the wrong reasons, like so that people will praise you. But listen, all you'll get is people's praise. But you can say the shortest, most succinct, God-honoring, quick, urgent prayer if your audience is the Lord. And that prayer will bring God's reward. Again, the question is not just, are you praying? The important thing is, is why are you praying? And then he gets to this section on um, prayer that also includes affectionately what we refer to that we've already recited this morning as the Lord's Prayer. And <clears throat> I hate to disappoint you. Uh, I'm, not, I'm just barely going to touch on it. Um, we'll cover it again at some other point in another message. Perhaps we'll even do an entire message series on it. It's a really important prayer for us to unpack. But anyway, Jesus says, here's a model prayer. Here's a good way to pray. And so he's teaching his disciples. He just says, our Father in heaven. And so he just begins there. He's teaching them. It's like it's very intimate. If you have a personal relationship with Jesus, um, God's your Father. It's like, so it's this very intimate, very familial thing. It's our Father because it's communal. Like it's we're all together. We pray as one family to our Father. You ever thought about that? We pray together to our Father. He's like, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. And so like all those phrases are focused on God. Like this is God's agenda, not your agenda. Like, God, I don't know what your will is, but whatever it is, it be done. This focuses on him. Then it turns to us. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. So we forgive our debtors. Keep us from temptation. Deliver us from evil, right? So we bring our, our needs to God for daily provision, forgiveness, strength to face temptation. It gives us this great model prayer. And notice it's just not very long pretty short. Well, it's not grandiose or eloquent. It's just straight, concise, and to the point. And then after addressing the issue of worshiping through prayer, he then turns our attention to fasting. Now, 
But before we go any further, I think it's important that we take just a moment and talk about fasting, like what fasting is and why people do it. Um, some of you might not be familiar with spiritual fasting. I mean, when, when that comes to mind, the first thing in your mind may, especially in this day and age, because there's so much about intermittent fasting, and so you're thinking it's some latest diet fad or something like that. So I thought it'd be good for us to just take a look at what the Bible says about fasting itself. Fasting in its simplest form means not eating what you'd normally eat when you'd normally eat it. I, that, literally, if you could just break it down to the most simplest form, it's like not eating what you'd normally eat when you'd normally eat it. Like it might be part of a day, it might last all day, it might last uh, for a week, it could last 40 days. We've seen that in scripture. It might be abstaining from all food and water, it might just be abstaining from certain foods and beverages. But in the Bible, fasting, th th this might fascinate some of you, in the Bible, fasting is most often associated with sorrow. There's many times in the Bible um, where, uh, as we're reading through and, and we encounter all these different uh, characters, real people who really uh, lived, as we encounter their stories and the narrative about their lives. There are people who've experienced this deep sorrow, times when they've been encountered um, by God about the sin that's in their life, and, and they are, like, they are crushed and broken when confronted by the sin, and it drives them to, to deep sorrow, and their response in those moments when they're broken by their sin is to fast. And so it's associated with humbling yourself before God, turning from your sin, seeking his forgiveness. That, that, that's like the primary use of fasting in Scripture. There's a couple of other uses as well. We also see fasting associated with prayer. Um, you might think of a, a lady named uh, Hannah who wanted to have a baby but couldn't have a baby, and, and so the Scripture tells us she was fasting and praying. Uh, David, who King David, who's just watching his infant son lay dying. He's praying, he's fasting. And the idea wasn't that their prayers were more powerful if they were fasting. The idea was they were so occupied with praying to God that food just wasn't important to them. That's just, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to skip a meal. If I skip this meal, God will keep my son alive. If I don't eat for the next week, surely my son will live. No, that's not what's happening. It's like I am just praying that God would save the life of my son, and I'm so preoccupied with that, I'm just not eating. Food's just not that important. We, we see fasting mentioned in the Bible also having to do with the beginning of like significant um, spiritual movements or movements in ministry. For example, Moses fasted 40 days before receiving the Ten Commandments. Jesus fasted 40 days in the desert before launching into his ministry. The church at Antioch fasted and prayed before they sent... Um, Barnabas and Paul out to evangelize. And so I tell you that because I think for some of you, that might be a little different picture than what you expect to hear about fasting. Like it's easy to get the impression, especially in the church, because we like in our Christian subculture, we turn little things like this into programs. We write books about them and have weight loss programs and all kinds of stuff and make it super spiritual and it has nothing to do with that. That's not what this is about. Like somehow when you don't eat, God's bound to hear you better. Fasting in the Bible has nothing to do with that. It's not about better physical health. It's not about racking up points with God. It's not about empowering your prayers. If you want to fast, fasting in the Bible has to do with people that are so preoccupied in their relationship with God that food just takes a back seat. And just not, I don't have time for that because I'm praying right now. And so with that background on fasting, let's jump back into Jesus' sermon. So maybe this makes a little more sense. Verse 16, Jesus says, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, 
For they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who's in secret. And your Father who's in secret will reward you. So again, remember, um, Jesus is talking here about the Pharisees who were some like, very conservative religious leaders of the day. They fasted twice a week. And apparently, uh, when they fasted, they, everything that I read this week um, says that they put ashes on their face. Now, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. And you probably, as you are going about your day Wednesday afternoon, you maybe see people out in the public with you know, a little bit of ash right here on their forehead. In fact, um, Toby Palmer is, is, is going to lead our youth. We, I don't think we've ever done an Ash Wednesday thing around here. And he and I were talking, and I was like, yeah, man, you might as well try it. Just see, you know, teach on it with the youth. Let's, let's talk about it. It's something the church has done for a long time. So on this Ash Wednesday, Wednesday night at, at student ministry, they're going to talk about um, Ash Wednesday and why people do that. And, and, and so what Jesus is talking about here, though, is that apparently uh, when they were fasting, uh, instead of just putting a little, what looks like a little smudge right there, and I tell you that, by the way, because I know some of you want to be out Wednesday afternoon, you're like, hey, let me fix that for you, and so don't do that, okay? And so what they did was they just put ashes all over their face, like all over their face. The, The word that's used here is disfigured, but that word in the original language just means hidden and unseen. So it doesn't mean they really disfigured themselves. It means hidden and unseen. In essence, their faces became visible because they just put so much ash on their face. And and so in doing that, what they thought was making their face invisible actually made them very visible to others. That's what Jesus is saying. He uses this word gloomy, right? So they put on these sad faces, and they look very sullen. And he uses again that word disfigured about being very visible when trying to be invisible. But Jesus says, if you do these things, you're completely missing the point. Verse 16, he says, truly I say to you, if you do it for those reasons or that's how you do it, you've received your reward. By contrast, Jesus says to do the opposite of letting everyone know that you're fasting. That's why he says, go wash your face. Get the smudges off. Do your hair. Don't draw attention to yourself. You don't need to let everyone else know that you're fasting. It's like if you're fasting to concentrate on your relationship with God, great, great. I mean, that's really between you and him. No one else needs to know, so don't be obvious about it. Don't go to a Super Bowl party this afternoon if you're fasting and look at the big spread in front of you and, and someone says, hey, help yourself to some wings and, you know, like the nacho dip or, you know, queso or whatever else in there. Sausage in your queso, do you do that? Anybody? Hands coming over to your house for a Super Bowl party this afternoon. Um, like... And so someone invites you to the table to, to eat, and you're like, yeah, no thanks, man. I'm, I'm fasting. I mean, I'd... Like, just, you know, just say, hey, no, thank you. And then just move on. It's like, don't draw attention to it. Jesus is not saying, by the way, that you've, you've done anything wrong if people know that you're fasting. It's not about that. He's just, you don't do it to impress other people. If you fast to impress other people, what you get is impressed people. It's not an issue of who knows about it or what they think about it. It's what is your motive? Are you doing this for people or for God? And so here's the bottom line. Jesus says that if you're involved in a lot of religious activity, in an effort to keep in good graces with the people that are around you. If your motives are unpure, you're trying to impress all the people that are around you. Listen to me. He says that has no value to God. None. 
that if your motive for coming to church, doing some good deed, helping a little old lady with her groceries across the street, praying to God, fasting, if you're doing that for recognition and admiration of the people around you, you will get admiration and you will get praise and that doesn't mean anything to God. And so really, here's the most important question that we need to answer individually in here this morning. Who is your audience? Who is the object of worship? Who are you worshiping? And who are you doing those things for? Are are, are you doing it just to keep the peace with those that are around you? Are you doing it because you want to honor and obey God? Because here's what I know. If you do it in, in an effort to seek him, you will find him. And in that, there is no greater reward. Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me for just a moment? Father, as we are gathered uh, in this place uh, together today, uh, as we've opened up uh, your word, uh, I uh, just trust that the Holy Spirit is, is doing a work in hearts and minds in here today. Father, I, I just know uh, with a room this size, with the number of people that are in here, that there are, are people who have um, misguided motives, who are worshiping you, not all things, but some things um, they do, not for uh, the benefit of worshiping you, but, but just so it'll keep the peace with others. Just so a spouse, a friend, a brother, a sister, someone else at church, maybe it's a business associate, just someone that they're trying to impress. And Jesus says, that's worthless. And so Holy Spirit, just do a work in our hearts today. Help us as we go about our week and we have moments to take care of the poor and give to the needy. Uh, In moments of prayer, especially public prayer, maybe we're um, praying over a meal that we're sharing with somebody, even at lunch here in a little bit, or maybe at Bible study this week or in our small group. God, perhaps even some of us are so sorrowful here this morning in in a season of sorrow that we're even fasting. Just help us to know that all these religious acts of worship, they're done for you and you alone and no one else. Help our motives to be pure. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, again, thank you for being here today. I think the rain is uh, holding off a little bit. Um, And go Chiefs, right? Uh, if you are a visitor today, I, I'd love to meet you out in the lobby. Most, most Sundays, right after the service, you can just find me out there in the middle of the lobby, and I'm a little easy to find today. And so um, I'd love to, to meet you. Just come by and introduce yourself. And if you're here today and you're part of our prayer team, uh, that you, and you um, are available to come down here at the end of the service and, and pray with others, uh, if our prayer team would come forward, and would you go ahead and stand? And then if you're here today, and maybe you just came in with some, some heavy burdens, some things uh, in your life, and you just want to pray uh, with somebody, there'll be folks from our prayer team down here as we dismiss to, to pray with you. Let's read our benediction uh, together. These words will be on the screen. Father, help us to live this week to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. And Holy Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. Amen. You're dismissed.